Greetings, viewers. Uh, apologies for the lateness of this latest slew of videos. I have three upcoming. Uh, I fell sick, so I actually lost my voice for a few days. I could not record until recently. Uh, latest issue of Uplink is up, and this issue focuses on China. And this is actually the first time I've actually sat down and written a political economy critique of China. There's a tremendous amount of mythology about China as a nation, polity, society these days. And there are two camps. One is the paranoid fear, China's going to take over the world. And the other is the paranoid ecstasy that, oh, yes, China's going to take over the world. So uh, you can go ahead and read the article. The, the economics is I've released free to the public. Some of the cultural analysis will take a little longer to unlock because it's behind a paywall. In three months, I'll release that. But the takeaway is this. China is a very important middle-income nation, but it is not going to run the world. Not now. Not ever. Sorry, China, you're just another important nation in a big world system. A great nation, fantastic people, fantastic history, fantastic culture, but not in charge of anything, and certainly not in charge of the planet on any serious framework. Uh, China is important because it is a very large nation, 1.4 billion people. It's the largest nation of the semi-periphery. Uh, the semi-periphery, by the way, the, all the people that live in the semi-periphery these days are roughly 50% of the human race. So half of our entire planet lives in the semi-periphery, and China is about a third of that half. So roughly, and they're in the middle income. They're actually their income is actually straight in the middle of the income distribution of the semi-periphery. So the middle of the middle income, and entirely typical of a lot of the contradictions. Uh, China's boom and com contemporary bust can be summed up in a single phrase. China, there was no miracle that occurred between 1979 and 2008. China urbanized and industrialized um, following the model of a lot of late industrializers throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. Uh, its growth rates were very similar to those of, say, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia between 1945 and 1975, comparable to those of, say, uh, Brazil and Mexico between 1940 and 1970, 75 or so. Uh, but like those other nations, China has the fundamental constraint that it was going from a low-income society to a middle-income society. So the strategies that you can use to take a society that's agrarian, villages, peasants on farms, and turn them into workers in cities, uh, you could do that once, and you can use certain strategies to get there. But then once you have that urbanized society of, of of urban workers, then it's a lot harder to keep growing your economy. The old strategies no longer work. And that's where China is. They're stuck. And it's not the middle income trap. That's never been the middle income trap. There are a lot of nations that went middle income, but then kept on growing. The middle income trap, as economists talk about it, is actually the democracy deficit. It's the reason, the biggest single reason that the middle income nations stay middle income and do not get richer is that they fail to democratize their political constraints inside of these societies. Very obvious in the case of Brazil, where you have an elite, they want to invest in the country or in Brazilians, so they'd rather just rule over shambles of an economy. Russia, you have 100 oligarchs, they're taking the money out and putting it into Swiss bank accounts. They don't care about the people of Russia. They can rot for all they care. And they're just taking the oil money and spending on wild parties and using Putin to justify their rule. Of course, Russia is not going to grow and has not grown since 2008. Brazil has not grown since 2009. Uh, none of the semi peripheries are doing very well under these authoritarian governments. China is just the latest to this party of dysfunction. And they got away with it for a long time because they were a big exporter but that game has come to an end. So to understand China's position in the world system, one of the best stories about China, of a, a supply chain company back in 2018 did an analysis of an, a China-made Apple iPhone. And when you look carefully at the hardware, hardware is $240, they calculated how much of that value was created by Chinese firms. And they looked at the supply bill and they took it apart and they realized that around $8 and change was from domestic Chinese firms. 3.5%. Uh, the rest was from Korean firms, Taiwanese firms, Japanese, American, European, so on and so on and so on and so on. So 
that really does express where China is in the world system of industrialization. They do have factories, but they're dependent upon foreign demand. They do have a large middle class, but it's a very recent structure tied to the big cities and their economic model is now in deep crisis. Since 2012, they have not addressed their problems and have gone back to an authoritarian mode of governance. So the current government has become increasingly repressive and vicious towards dissidents and whatnot. And that's gone hand in hand with an enormous speculative bubble. So China has one of the biggest real estate bubbles in the world. My article talks about it and gives some of the references and citations. So when you hear stories about how, oh, China has a $14 trillion economy. No, it's not worth $14 trillion. China has a large economy. It's probably worth eight or nine trillion of real value, but a lot of those trillions of value are actually fictional. They're ghost cities, they're these projects, prestige projects that actually aren't going to pay for any, uh, airports that don't connect anyone, bridges that don't go anywhere, uh, lots of infrastructure that's actually not going to be useful and they're overpaying for. So they have the, an enormous financial headache ahead of them. And they may avoid an overt crisis, but China is going to grow very slowly over the next probably the next 10 to 15 years, possibly as many as 20 years. Um, the, the histories of bubbles are not pretty. J Japan paid for its bubble with 20 years of stagnation. There's no way China makes out of this, makes it out of this without at least a comparable period of stagnation.